All right, good morning. It's 11 o'clock. We're going to get started with the webinar. Um, I just want to thank everybody joining us, who's joining us today. We have a number of folks from within Ontario and also uh, municipalities and organizations attending from uh, outside of the province. So thank you very, thank you very much for joining in. Uh, it will be, it's one of the really cool webinars that we have lined up uh, and the topic is the future of municipal mobility and I do have Aaron Foster with us today. Um, I, before, but before I pass it on to Aaron, um, there's just a few things to get out of the way. So my name is Fahad Shuja and I am the Member and Technical Services Coordinator with the Ontario Good Roads Association. Uh, if you're aware of OGRA, uh, likely if you're from Ontario, then you know Ontario Good Roads Association. But if not, for those of um, our guests from outside, I uh, just want to have a couple of slides to, to tell you what we're all about. So we started in 1894, and yes, that's 123 plus years ago. We are a not-for-profit. And um, the reason for the organization being was that uh, there was a need to... Um, about 122 plus years ago, there was a need to um, for municipalities to know how to build and sustain good roads and good quality. So what our forefathers of our organization did was um, they used to have uh, something called an OGRA train and they will go out to different municipalities with their equipment, staff, material, um, and they would educate the municipality on how to build proper and sustainable roads. Um, so since then, um, since they did that throughout the province, uh, we've been really lucky to have some very close bonds with a number of, number, number of municipalities from across the province. Um, and it's since then, we've also had, um, uh, we've, we've grown uh, and we now have uh, an education, a formal training section that, that uh, does a lot of great courses throughout the year. Uh, we also do advocacy. In addition to that, we do member and technical services, and uh, this is where I'm from. And uh, we also hold a very large annual conference every year in February in Toronto. And uh, there's tons of more stuff that we do. And uh, if you need to get more information about OGRA, you can head to OGRA.org. Now, if you look at the time of 1894, this was a time when people were uh, in masses switching from horses to cars, so there was a need to have a uh, proper infrastructure in place, and that's why OGRA was. Created, um, so if we, we feel that it's in our DNA to watch out for any disruptive technologies that can uh, transfer, transform transport transportation sector in general, um, and so it makes uh, complete sense even from the DNA perspective for us to um, be on the lookout and see how our uh, at least for Ontario and Canada how the world will change uh, now that we're moving from manual to truly automatic drive. We did a white paper called uh, Roadmap for autonomous vehicles in Ontario, and you do, we do have a, a PDF file of it in the handout section, so if you look at, into your panel, you'll be able to download that file. Um, now, this, the webinar you're attending right now is a part of a series, and the intention is for us to bring forward subject matter experts like Aaron today. Uh, we've had two webinars just before this as well, uh, and the intention is to bring forward uh, to all the OGRA members and everybody else who might be interested in Canada to learn more about where the autonomous vehicles are heading and what are the what's the, what's some what is some good work that's being done by municipalities and also by uh, the private sector. So before I get started, uh, as Aaron is going through his presentation, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, post your questions up and we will take them at the end of the presentation. So just before I pass it on to Aaron, just want to uh, tell you a little bit about him. Um, Aaron has benefited from a wide range of special influences from filmmaking to disruptive business development and has also wor been working in the transportation industry for almost 10 years. His work in the last five years has been with electric, connected, and autonomous vehicles and is focused on solving the problems that the space when addressing the first and last mile of their commute. Aaron's professional goals are to reduce congestion and pollution while increasing pedestrian safety in urban areas. So with that, I want to pass it off to Aaron. Well, thank you, Fahad. Um, we'll get the screen going here. And um, I want to thank um, you, Fahad, and also everyone that's dialed into the call for taking some time to uh, learn about the Navia technology. 
Um, November has been a very big month for our company. There's been a lot of big announcements um, and um, a lot of good news to share with you guys about uh, the coming months um, and years ahead with Navia. Um, so just to get the 300 pound gorilla out of the uh, room here, I'm sure most people have heard now that um, we are running a year long demonstration in the city of Las Vegas. Um, and it is the first uh, autonomous shuttle to be operating in mixed traffic open roads in the United States. Um, unfortunately, on the first day of that demonstration, uh, the vehicle was involved in an accident. Um, and I'd like to stress that we were not found uh, to be liable. Um, the driver of, the, uh, of a truck that ran into our shuttle actually when it was stopped uh, was ticketed. And um, there was a statement that was actually issued by AAA, who's uh, one of our partners out there. Um, and it reads, the autonomous shuttle testing today was grazed by a delivery truck downtown. The shuttle did what it was supposed to do in that its sensors registered the truck and the shuttle stopped to avoid the accident. Unfortunately, the delivery truck did not stop and graze the front fender of the shuttle. Had the truck had the same sensing equipment that the shuttle has, the accident would have been avoided. Testing of the shuttle will continue during the 12-month pilot in the downtown innovation district. Um, so beyond that, um, I really don't have too much more to comment just because the investigation or the accident is still under investigation, but um, I really do see this as a positive, being that um, you know our company, Navia, we've transported well over 200,000 passengers uh, since the technology was released in 2015. Um, this is the first incident of any kind um, we're not being found at fault. There were no injuries, and it was extremely minimal. So um, a figure that's you know tossed around a lot of times is that about 94% of all accidents are caused by human error. Um, unfortunately, this is an example of that. Um, and then the plus is that uh, this is another learning opportunity for us where we can really uh, you know get access to all the data pre and during the collision and then really recreate it, make some improvements on the vehicle. And uh, being that these are all connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, all of those lessons that are learned can really be you know, sent out to the entire fleet of vehicles to really continue improving the safety and the experience uh, of our riders. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll start into my presentation here. So essentially, Navio really has um, three main missions. We want to improve the service for the first and last mile commuter. Um, we want to increase the capacity of existing transportation systems, and we are uh, keenly interested in serving new areas um, that were not previously served by the transit systems. Um, I'll just give you a quick little intro video here. Um, it'll give a little bit of history on uh, why we're doing what we're doing, and there is some pretty good overlap uh, with the Ontario Good Roads Association, um, with how you all were founded. <laughs> Let's 
what's next? Why don't we find out for ourselves? Not yet. It's going to make a surprise announcement. And it's going to be very special. Okay? Okay. So that um, was a video that was a uh, teaser for an announcement that our company ended up making last week um, in that we now have uh, two separate platforms for autonomous mobility. We have our shuttle that will go into a little bit more in depth today. Um, and then we also have a new uh, robo taxi, a six passenger vehicle um, that has a little bit higher level of uh, technical capability um, that will go into a little bit more in depth. But essentially, uh, as the message said, you know, we have all these problems that cities are facing. Um, we have studies that are showing that by 2050 we're expecting 70% of the worldwide population uh, to be concentrated into urban areas. Um, and it's really going to take a lot of political and lifestyle changes in order for us to really make this sustainable. Um, we see the images on the right here, uh, congestion, pollution, and parking. These are all you know, three issues that really feed into each other. Um, a lack of parking breeds congestion for people looking for parking, which then increases pollution um, and just really begins to make a runaway effect. And if we keep doing everything the same way that we have been doing, um, we're just not going to solve these problems. So we see uh, automated vehicles, um, specifically our shuttles, um, being really keenly um, able to solve these problems. Um, we're increasing the network uh, efficiency of the existing transportation system. Um, and we're able to do that by right-sizing transportation options and really using a multimodal transportation system where we're incorporating everything from advocating walking, biking, bike sharing, and then our shuttles all the way up to a full-size bus or train and everything in between. So really making sure that um, when you're going those short trips, maybe a mile, two, three miles, uh, it doesn't always make sense to use a, a single occupant vehicle, you know, taking up more room on the road. So that's why we're really advocating for this shared mobility, shared transportation. Um, and with that is improving access to service on the first and last mile. So someone who would otherwise be interested and open to taking public transit um, really can have difficulty getting access to that being, um, you know, on a nice sunny day, it's not a problem. Um, but then if the weather is inclement or if they're, you know, carrying a large amount of packages, it's just not re realistic to use on a day-to-day -day model. Um, additionally, um, we're looking to certain new areas um, where transit has really not been able to penetrate, getting into the neighborhoods where a 40 bus um, may not be fully utilized or may not be welcomed by the residents because of the sound and the noise pollution. Um, so we're really looking to increase the utilization of these multimodal transportation systems and not really replace anything that's existing with our solutions, but really plug it in and make it a more efficient system overall. Um, so, you know, increasing access to that first and last mile is going to remove a lot of those single occupant vehicles from the roads. Um, and those that have the same type of benefits, whether we're talking um, a public road type of site like a city, um, or a private site, which would be something more like an airport or a large industrial campus. Um, we're going to be increasing the safety being that these vehicles are automated and censored. Um, we're going to be able to increase the frequency of travel being that um, we're plugging our vehicles into an existing system to really um, increase its efficiency. We're reducing CO2 emissions being that this is a battery electric vehicle. Uh, so we're extremely reduced carbon footprint based off of uh, or when compared to an internal combustion vehicle. And then depending on the source of the electricity um, can potentially be carbon neutral. Um, now, the next piece here, the infrastructure, our vehicle does not require any additional infrastructure to be installed on the site. We don't require any magnets in the roads. Um, we don't require any additional uh, connected traffic lights or anything else uh, to make the vehicle really work. Um, in those environments. And we're able to really increase the, uh, the area from a working condition, from a productivity standpoint, quality of life. Um, people are, you know, worried less about getting from point A to point B, um, and they're doing it in a much more relaxed and comfortable way. 
Now, these vehicles have applications far beyond just cities. Um, we've had a lot of very successful deployments in cities, um, but you can see some of the other applications here. Industrial sites um, are where we have our largest size fleets. Uh, airports are starting to become much more popular. We're starting to deploy into a lot of European airports. Uh, university campuses are somewhere that we're seeing a lot of interest here in North America, as well as from uh, hospitals and theme parks. So you're going to be seeing some major announcements from our company over the next year about some rather sizable deployments. Now, as far as the company goes, we've actually been um, in production of the vehicle, started delivering in 2015. Um, but we've put over 200,000 engineering man hours into the development of this vehicle. Um, a process that's taken about seven years uh, from when it started. Um, originally based out of France, we have our corporate headquarters uh, in Paris, and then we have our manufacturing in Lyon, France. Um, just this year, we actually established our North American presence um, with an uh, office just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, which is where the University of Michigan um, is hosted. We've got some strategic agreements um, with other transit agencies, Vallejo and Kiolis as well, who's actually an investor into our company. Um, and then we've deployed more shuttles um, from a full autonomous standpoint than any other manufacturer worldwide. We've moved more passengers, we've driven more miles, um, and we just have much more data and refinement to our system at this point. So I do want to stress with this slide, um, we're obviously, we're level four, 100% autonomous. That's a 15 passenger capacity. We've got spots for 11 seats and then four standing passengers as well. But we are 100% battery electric and this is 100% available. We're far beyond the proof of concept stage um, and sort of, you know, proving out this technology. Now, everybody always wants to understand how this uh, vehicle is actually able to operate. And we're able to do that because of a series of complementary and redundant systems. Um, so for localization, the shuttle needs to know exactly where it is with a very high degree of accuracy. Um, and for this, we use our GNSS antenna, which is able to receive uh, GPS satellite signals as well as RTK satellite signals. In a traditional smartphone or in-vehicle navigation system, um, you're only getting a few satellites, maybe four to six satellites, um, which is giving you a degree of accuracy within a few meters, um, which is good for the application. But for ours, you know, since we don't have a driver, um, you know, really maintaining lane lines and things like that, um, we're actually able to get up to 18 satellites, which gives us a degree of accuracy of only one centimeter in either direction. Uh, which is very impressive. I've seen the shuttle um, through a video drive around a closed track up here in Michigan last winter, um, and it goes around the track several times, leaving only a single set of tire marks. It's just extremely accurate, extremely repeatable. Um, now, to verify those GNSS uh, signals, we use odometry, um, which are just very simple wheel speed sensors to verify that all of the wheels are pointing in the same direction, they're spinning at the same speed, things like that. Uh, to verify heading. Now, what really makes this special um, on top of that is the stereo vision cameras and the LiDAR sensors that we use for obstacle detection and avoidance. So when we deploy a shuttle onto a site, we drive the shuttle around and take an extremely detailed 3D map using the LiDAR, and then we remove anything from that map that's going to be variable. For instance, any parked cars, people, trash bins, things like that. Um, so we only have our fixed reference points. And then as the vehicle is driving around in its environment, it's comparing all those fixed reference points with its live environment to detect what the anomalies are, and then uses its stereo vision cameras to actually provide an additional level of information uh, to the system so it can make an appropriate decision on how to navigate around that obstacle, whether it uh, just stops, whether it uh, doesn't need to make any any change in direction if it's something like a bag rolling across the street. Now, um, we've also developed in-house something that we call Navia Lead, and this is essentially what we look at as fleet management uh, taken to the next level. 
So you'll get all of your traditional functionality that a fleet management portal would have. You'll be able to see exactly where each vehicle it is, where it is, how fast it's moving, all the operational information like battery state of charge. Um, and then we'll also be able to do remote diagnostics. So we are knowing exactly the state of health of the battery pack. We know the balance um, all the way down to the brake sensors. So if there's ever any um, issue that's going to be a potential mechanical breakdown, we actually have the ability to do some predictive maintenance algorithms, um, make sure that the vehicle is serviced and uh, never comes off of comes out of service because of a mechanical breakdown. Um, now, in the event that there is a mechanical breakdown, this Navi Lead Center is immediately notified. Uh, they get in contact with the shuttle driver and the occupants, make sure that everyone's safe. Um, and then are able to deploy the appropriate resources immediately um, with zero lag time. Now, um, we do also have the ability to get some, some information, for instance, for this uh, incident that happened in Las Vegas. We have all the video data from the cameras. We have all the LIDAR data. Um, so we're able to really very accurately and a very detailed level recreate any sort of accidents, um, any sort of incidents that may happen on the vehicle. And then lastly, um, this is our platform that we use to visualize um, any data and create any sort of rules of operation um, with the system. So you can really have as much or as little automated with the operation of the vehicle as possible. Um, if you'd like to go the extreme route and have it be fully automated, uh, we'll set up the rules as far as when, uh, what time the shuttle goes into service in the morning, what time it charges, and then what time it comes off of service in the evening. Um, we won't need anyone to interact with the vehicle um, as far as charging because we offer wireless charging pads that the vehicle will drive itself onto. Um, so really, you can have that full level of automation. Um, or if you want to have the vehicle be key operated, have somebody go to the vehicle, start it up in the morning, unplug it from the charger, um, it can be less automated uh, just based on your needs. Now, just going through some examples of um, some sites that we've operated at, um, we have both public and private sites. And essentially, the difference to us in terms of public or private is um, what level of authorization do we need? So for instance, uh, when we're operating on public roads in the United States, we require the authorization of the NHTSA and then the local municipality as well. Um, and then in France, um, it's a similar type of system. And then in some other areas like Australia, um, it's just much easier for us to deploy. Um, they've done a lot to remove any sort of uh, roadblocks from doing that. So one that I like to point out here is um, we have a demonstration called Navli in Lyon, France, where we're actually operating two shuttles on a purely pedestrian zone. Um, it's right along one of the rivers in Lyon. It's a very beautiful deployment that I actually got to see myself. Uh, it's about a one and a half kilometer uh, track, and there's five stops along this route. So that's one example where we have a point-to-point -point route where the shuttle will drive to one end of the track, and since it's a bi-directional vehicle, it simply just reverses direction and comes back like a trolley. And then we have another, um, another deployment at the bottom here in La Defense in Paris. Uh, which is a large business district, um, also a tourist area just because of some of the architectural features in there. Um, and again, this is a purely pedestrian area. Uh, we do not have any lane lines. We don't have any barriers that are preventing people from walking alongside or in front of the vehicle. Um, and there are just hundreds and thousands of people walking around this area at any given time. So it's a very dynamic environment for it to operate. And I was very impressed to see the level of confidence that the vehicle operated in that environment. Now, as far as private sites go, these are much easier for us to deploy, much more quick, because all we need is the authorization of the landowner. So, um, for instance, the EDF Chevaux in France, that is a large uh, power plant where we have six of our shuttles deployed, where they're actually already looking to replace, they had an existing shuttle system using some internal combustion vehicles. They're of service, um, and they were essentially looking at how they want to replace that system because it wasn't terribly reliable. Um, it was only running about every 15, 20 minutes, so it didn't provide a lot of value to the people on the site. A lot of them would just end up walking. 
Um, so we delivered six vehicles. We reduced the, the wait time to between five and 10 minutes. Um, and that's actually gonna be the first site worldwide where we'll be operating our shuttle fully autonomous without an operator. Um, and that's something that, um, that the customer came to us and requested. They said, you know, our employees are very comfortable with these vehicles. They understand how to interact with the HMI uh, to get from point A to point B. Um, and they really wanted to, to take that next step. So that's something that we intend on doing next year. And then um, our closest customer to home, at least for myself here, would be M-City um, with the University of Michigan. And M-City, if you're not familiar with it, is a very large autonomous vehicle testing ground um, that is a public-private partnership between the University of the State of Michigan um, and then a lot of the OEMs and other companies that are you know, interested in connected and autonomous vehicles. We have two vehicles deployed there um, for both a research standpoint, so the students have access to them. They can really learn um, and have a real-world application for an autonomous vehicle. And then also um, our shuttles are used to give tours, so anytime a VIP, any delegate comes to M-City, uh, they're going to get a ride around the, the grounds in our shuttle. So it's really a feather in our cap that um, the place in, in the United States that's really seen at the forefront of uh, testing and developing autonomous technologies, uh, anytime they want to impress someone, they get a ride in our shuttle. So it's a very nice feather in our cap for that. And then lastly, anytime there's a large event, at M-City, they'll use our shuttles to bring people to and from M-City uh, from the remote parking lots. So for instance, uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, uh, the Secretary of Transportation for the United States was out here um, and they were unveiling the new list of automated vehicle guidelines, safety guidelines. So our shuttles were you know, very fortunate to be shuttling everybody around that, that property for that event as well. So just to come back to these couple key figures here, um, we've moved more passengers, over 200,000 today. Um, we've got over 50 vehicles operating worldwide right now on a permanent deployment basis, uh, and several others that are operating um, just on a sort of rotating pilot schedule. Now here's just a quick video showing this shuttle. This slide, what I wanted to um, drive home is that we really make this an a la carte type of system um, for what you're looking to deploy it at. Um, we have some ideas about how the vehicle has been utilized in the past. We have some ideas about how it can be used in the future. Um, but just over the last few months that I've been at the company, um, we've had some really interesting ideas posed to us in different ways to use the vehicle for um, package delivery, um, for becoming a mobile type of uh, grocery store. There's just so many different ways to use this vehicle. And not all of our services really make sense for somebody. Um, so we really can come and provide a complete turnkey offer for you. Um, if that makes sense, we can provide the shuttle to you. Um, we can provide a partner for the insurance. We'll provide the fleet maintenance and supervision. We'll provide the uh, mechanical maintenance on the vehicle as well as provide uh, the software license that'll give you all of the updates that are sent out over the air. Um, so just to come back to that, 
we do have the ability to update our entire fleet over the air to continue improving the experience and the safety of the vehicle. And one of the examples of that is that with the new uh, platform that was announced last week, we have a much more on-demand capability to the vehicle to where we're not tied to the fixed route anymore. So if you imagine we'll have um, anywhere within a range of up to about five miles, we'll have a geofenced area, we'll have all of the roads mapped within that environment, and you'll be able to really use the vehicle from a point A to a point B um, if it's taken off of that fixed route system. So that's something that can really be managed through Navia Lead, whether you want it to be on demand or fixed route, and that can change at a moment's notice uh, based on the customer's request. So that's something that's not only being integrated into the new vehicle, but that's going to be a software update that's sent out to our entire fleet worldwide of shuttles. Um, so we're not limiting that to only brand new vehicles. Um, so really the software updates are the only portion that all of our customers have taken, uh, but aside from that, any piece can really be a la carte. Now, one last video for you it just gives a little bit of information on the new platform, our, uh, what we call the RoboTaxi. All right, thanks, thanks, Aaron. You, you cut, it got cut off just in the last five, ten seconds. Oh, sorry. Just wanted to thank you for your time. No, thank you. Thank you for uh, for doing the presentation. I think it looks wonderful, and uh, I thank you for also clarifying the issue from last week. It just creates further case that human drivers can't be really, uh, uh, you know, can be as reliable, cannot be as reliable as autonomous vehicles. So we're looking forward to where the where the future goes.